places have had national mandatory mask requirements. We still do not have that. If you can, if you can believe that with 16 million cases, we still do not mandate masks. Now, each state has some freedom to pass certain laws and policies in, in California. There um, are many counties that have mask requirements, but there is nothing at the national level. So another huge part of this problem has been our president leader, um, Donald Trump. So I wanted to show you, and hopefully you, um, you can hear this. I wanted to show you a very quick video, a clip about this. So let me know if you can't hear it. Are the words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all. How concerned are you? Well, we pretty much shut it down. You know, a lot of people think that goes away in April. We have contained this, I won't say airtight, but pretty close to airtight. It's going to be down to close to zero. It's going to disappear. It's like a miracle. It will disappear. Uh, they're going to have vaccines, I think, relatively soon. What can you say to Americans who are concerned that you're not taking this seriously enough? That's CNN. Fake news. The president say, for example, he's going to continue with, with political rallies. Is this sending the right message? Going to a rally? There's no reason that you shouldn't go. It's really working out. The president stopped shaking hands. Uh, in our line of work. Uh, you shake hands. No, I don't take responsibility at all, but it's something that we have tremendous control of. I How would you rate your response to this crisis? I'd rate it a 10. This is a pandemic. I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. Yeah. So the no, words about a no, um, no early leadership. In fact, the the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, um, advised Americans early on to start wearing face masks. Trump said that guidance should be voluntary and consistently refused to show that example. He would say things like, I don't think I'm going to be doing it. And he actually didn't. Um, and you can see this was many days later, uh, when many weeks later, when he finally decided to wear a mask. So at, on, on this um, day, there were, the day he started to wear a mask, um, a thousand people died in a single day. This is a photo of one is, of his Trump rallies in May. Um, Herman Cain is the guy in the middle. He is a was a, a former presidential candidate um, and current senator. Um, he went attended the a rally, political rally for Trump, and got COVID and died one month later. This was Trump. Two days ago, December 12th, at a football game against um, Army Navy football game uh, with West Point cadets. And again, he refused to wear a mask. This is in my own city. This is um, Orange County near Los Angeles, where the sheriff of our county has said he will not enforce any requirements because it is um, against people's individual freedoms and that law enforcement should not get involved. Something else that's quite surprising is you maybe heard about our stimulus package Early on, the um, Congress passed a package uh, where people would get, if you were on the lower income side, you would get $1,200, $1,200 US. And I know that might sound like a lot of money, but that 
doesn't even pay for a, an apartment for most people. But he actually stopped. Um, he, he postponed the submissions, the sending out of people's checks because he wanted to ensure that his signature was on the US Treasury Department checks. And that was um, because he wanted people to think that he was the one that was giving them the money. But it was a, you know, a big issue because the president is not actually authorized to sign checks from the Treasury Department. Um, and so that was what the delay was. Um, he also did not want to take any responsibility at the national level. And he did start a new coronavirus task force, but he appointed um, as the vice president, uh, as the leader, the vice president who had no public health or medical education and no one on the entire task force was an MD or had any public health or medical background. You maybe heard about this in the news, but he was fueling racism and misinformation by calling coronavirus the China virus and for blaming China for mass worldwide killing. Um, he called it a hoax and he and his son and many other people have posted misinformation um, and actually Twitter and Facebook have had to block their, their posts for this very harmful misinformation because people were believing it. Let's look at some of the history of the policies that led up to this um, catastrophic response. So in 2015, um, the Obama administration created a global health security and biodefense unit which is responsible for preparedness for pandemics or infectious disease outbreaks. This was disbanded. This was um, removed by the White House in 2018. He, uh, Trump administration every year has tried to cut funding to the Centers for Disease Control specifically for global health and global disease outbreak prevention. Even in the middle of a pandemic, uh, they proposed 16% um, in cuts to the Center for Disease Control's budget at the same time that we're seeing a pandemic. Of course, he also uh, defunded and removed the United States from the World Health Organization. So it, he called it um, very China-centric and said that the WHO was misleading the world about the pandemic. Our leadership has also consistently um, supported economics, economic growth over health. So these are people all over the country that were protesting um, when, you know, uh, shutdowns of businesses and bars and things. And when Trump was asked about this, he said, these people love our country. That was, that was his actual quote. He encouraged protesters to, quote, liberate states that were imposing curfews and restrictions and um, tweeted this many, many times, think, saying that these closures of businesses were too tough and um, that these were protesters were great people. Another really important thing um, to keep in mind is how 
how much we need data during these times. Yet, uh, the US does not have national data, state level data, county or even city level data standards for how we're reporting information about COVID-19. In fact, no two states out of the 50 report or present the data in the same way. So that makes it really difficult to be able to draw comparisons across states. In July, the Department in Health and Humans of Health and Human Services removed the Center for Disease Control um, from taking control, being in charge of the national COVID-19 data and instead gave it to a private company. The American Public Health Association, Johns Hopkins University, the former director of the CDC and many other people have called the, that situation um, information catastrophe. It is absolutely the wrong approach. We need national public health information systems to record diagnoses, to monitor um, regional differences and demographic differences, differences in health system response across our country. And we, we have to have the data in order to do that. As I mentioned, they have also um, very much prioritize individual rights and liberties over collective good. So this is, these photos are during the middle of the lockdown. These are when beaches were supposed to be closed, public swimming, bars, everything was, all of these were supposed to be closed and everybody was at, supposed to be at home. These are rallies of, um, for, for the president and these are back on November, uh, right before the election, when we knew how insane the, um, the, you know, the cases were. And Stanford University did a study looking at Trump rallies and they found that the 18 re-election campaigns um, have resulted in more than 30,000 cases of COVID just between the end of June and the end of September. Out of these 18, there were only three that were inside, um, but um, they also found that these rallies likely resulted in over 700,000 deaths. So they did that through contact tracing. Um, this is Barbara Ferrer. She is the director of the Los Angeles Department of Public Health. It's the largest public health department in the United States. She has had death threats. She has to have surveillance, um, police escorts at her house. People are at her house every day protesting her recommendations for lockdown. More than 70 leaders in public health offices, um, public offices, you know, pub public servants uh, and leaders have been fired or who or have left their posts since just since the pandemic began because of the amount of criticism, um, protesting, personal safety problems and also because they feel like they're not being heard, they're not being taken seriously. Just last week, uh, there in Idaho, there was a public health official who during a meeting, uh, on a Zoom meeting, she was at the office, the police called and said that there were protesters banging on her front door and her 12 year old son was there alone and was scared. So these are the kinds of things that are happening. 
Um, I wanted to give you, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but just some of the key points um, in terms of the timeline. So as I mentioned, January 21st was the first case that was confirmed. Um, and then by February 26th, we had community spread. Um, you can see it, the WHO declared this a pandemic on March 11th and by March 19th, the US State Department warns against all international travel. In March, we had over 10 million Americans apply for unemployment benefits just in one month. And that was an, a record. You can see by April, uh, some of the things that I was talking about, we had, um, you know, Trump talking about the World Health Organization as mishandling the pandemic. Uh, by April, he was, he actually suggested checking whether uh, drinking disinfectant would help treat the coronavirus. In April, our Attorney General of the United States said that we should monitor state and local emergency responses to make sure that they are were not violating any constitutional rights or civil liberties. Uh, you can see in May, he Trump had been said he had been taking hydrochloroquine for over a week even though the US FDA cautioned against its use. Um, and he, many other things, he, um, in September, the White House blocked a draft order requiring passengers to wear masks on public transportation. They did not even want to force that um, rule. You could see probably you might have seen this, but in October when Trump got um, sick with the virus and spent some time in the hospital, he decided to take, while infectious, to leave the hospital in a car with his um, staff and uh, secret service protection um, and just so that he could wave to the fans. Um, and I also wanted to point out that in October, he called Dr. Fauci, one of our leading public health officials for the Center for Disease Control, um, called him an idiot. So there was a study done by Columbia University's Earth Science, Earth Institute's National Center for Disaster Preparedness. And they found that the, this type of response has led to between 130,000 and 210,000 deaths that could have been prevented if we had taken early and strong action like some of the other countries. So I also mentioned there, the third factor is really about social determinants. And this is where I would like to spend some uh, time now. So what are social determinants? Well, I think you probably um, talk about this in your classes. We definitely talk about this a lot in my classes. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the disparities in COVID cases and COVID deaths uh, by ethnic groups. So here you can see, as of today, Native Americans, so Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, um, and Native Americans were the most likely to have um, contracted COVID. And uh, you can see 
African Americans are the most likely to die from COVID. So Asian and white, much, much less in terms of cases and deaths as compared to other ethnic groups, Hispanics, African Americans, and Native Americans. In fact, we see that African Americans in particular are dying at almost two times the rate of white people. 64 deaths per 100,000 in whites and 119 deaths per 100,000 people in blacks. So why, why is this? Well, let's take a look at some of the determinants, social determinants. So the first one is our horrible healthcare system. So the population of the United States is about 328 million. Um, Latino and African American residents of the United States are about three times as likely to be infected as their white neighbors and about twice as likely to die. And Latinos who are in my age group between 40 and 59 years old have actually been infected five times the rate of white people in the same age group. And when you look at deaths um, of Latinos more who have died, more than a quarter of them were younger than 60 years old. These are not elderly 80 plus year old people who are dying. When you look at white people who are dying, only 6% of whites um, who died were under age 60. And one of the problems is that we're, we're finding recent studies are showing consistently that Black and Hispanic um, Americans have much lower levels of education around COVID-19, um, in, including prevention practices, symptoms, when to seek care, um, and all of that. And um, they also, we know that Black and Latino Americans are much more likely to have lower incomes and they're much more likely to have just the very basic public insurance. So in the United States, most of our insurance is funded through employers. The most Americans who have insurance, if they're not above you know, 65, it's through your job. Uh, well, that you know, is a problem if you have a very low paying job um, or an informal job or a part-time job, uh, you're not going to have access to healthcare, the healthcare system because you don't have insurance. Uh, and that's a real problem. I'm gonna show you some more statistics in a second, um, but we also have to talk about historical distrust and racism. And this has really emerged this year. You can imagine, I'm sure you have heard about the protests and Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we have really drawn attention to this problem. And I think COVID-19 has just exposed uh, these deep rooted issues in our culture. So look at this, this shows um, that one half and it's comparing us to other high income countries like Sweden, Germany, Australia, UK, et cetera. Half of United States adults with lower incomes skipped medical needed, uh, needed medical care or prescriptions in the past year because they could not afford them. And even if you're looking at lower income versus higher income, 
even the higher income adults, if you ha have um, higher rates of skipping met medical care, then even you know the lower income residents of many of the other countries listed here. So we are really not doing a, a very good job. So this um, you know looked at. Certainly, there are income related disparities that exist. Um, they are far worse in the United St States. There are great inequalities that are undermining our efforts to respond to the pandemic because adults who have lower income are often already more likely to be sicker, or to have, you know, to have health problems, pre-existing conditions, as a result of many years of lack of access to health care. So they're already in a disadvantaged population, uh, and it, compared to other countries. So. If, uh, the study found that more than one third of US adults who are low income had two or more chronic health conditions. Okay, so um, they about 36% had existing me uh, mental health issues also. So we know that health, um, you know, health conditions, pre existing health conditions. Can, do play a role in susceptibility uh, to COVID-19. Let's see. Next one. The, these are some examples here. So um, responding effectively to COVID really requires that they have access to healthcare services. And there are about 30 million people in the United States who don't have any insurance, medical insurance, and another 44 million people who are underinsured. So they may have a very basic care, but they have to pay high out of pocket costs, for example. And so you can you can take a look at this, uh, again, comparing to some other countries, more than two thirds of US adults said that their out of pocket costs would make, a, di make um, a difference in whether they sought care, even if they had COVID-19 symptoms. And, um, U.S. adults, including older adults, are were more likely to skip these visits, these this care, than the other countries. So you can see, thirty three percent had skipped any care, uh, compared to like seven percent in the United Kingdom or Germany, or eight percent in Netherlands or Sweden. Uh, and look at the you know, skipped recommended tests, 12% versus like 2% for Norway or France. So this is really important um, in terms of our risk. So this is populations at risk and uh, pre-existing conditions. So we have kind of an average amount of old, older adults compared to other high income countries, but we have many more pre-existing conditions like diabetes or respiratory, chronic respiratory infections that put us at greater risk of COVID and especially COVID related deaths as compared to other high income countries. We also have um, a shortage of healthcare workers in this country. So that's another issue. And I wanted to show you this photo. Maybe some of you have heard of this, but this is the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. 
So for those of you who don't know, this was a study done 80, 80 years ago uh, before we knew much about syphilis and before we had treatment for syphilis. And they enrolled um, Afri poor African-American men into the study. The problem is that once we had treatment, they withheld the treatment. Um, the, they did not even let them know that there was treatment available and they let them get basically die of horrendous um, consequences of syphilis in order to study if there was a racial difference in the body response, which is ridiculous. So, and this is just one example of some unethical experimentation and research done among um, or to minority populations in the United States and also abroad. We did similar studies in Guatemala and Puerto Rico, for example. This has caused a legacy of mistrust, in particular African Americans, but also some other groups, but um, it's very, very strong among African Americans. They do not trust the medical system. They do not want to participate in any in, in research. Um, they're already talking about not wanting to get the vaccine when it is available for COVID. This, these types of experiments have, have absolutely uh, ruined the relationship between health researchers in the African-American community. Some other social determinants that play a role are neighborhood and, phys and the physical environment. So we know that people from minority groups are disproportionately affected by homelessness, for example. In my city alone, we have 100,000 homeless people. It looks like, like a refugee camp. Um, and we know crowding, overcrowded housing uh, also is, is a risk factor. So people who, for example, uh, Latinos, Hispanics, tend to live many people in a house uh, compared to other groups. And that's creating a problem, a higher risk for being exposed. Okay, they also have, as I mentioned, comorbidities. And let's talk about their jobs. So Hispanic and, um, and, and minority groups are disproportionately represented in what we call essential workers. So people who have education, you know, like I can stay home and do my teaching from home, right? Many of you are doing the same. You, but people who are essential workers are more likely to work in a job, can't be done remotely and it puts them at risk. So these are things like grocery stores, food processing plants, public transportation, um, mechanics, factories. These are lower income jobs and they you know, require frequent or close contact with the public or with a lot of other workers and involve activities that cannot be done from home. Another important thing to note is our lack of labor laws. So we don't, these jobs often don't have paid sick days. So even if you're sick, you may still go to work. Even if you have symptoms, you may still decide to go to work that day. All right, um, what else? So I give you some examples here. 
just during April and May, 16,000 workers in meat and poultry processing facilities were, um, in, were tested positive for COVID-19. And 87% of those were African-American, Native American, or Hispanic. Uh, the, in July, there were 86 deaths that were tied to poultry uh, processing, for example. We also have some vulnerable, other vulnerable groups. You might know that Amer America has the highest incarceration rate, and we have had um, more than 400,000 people in jails and prisons infected and at least 1,800 inmates and correctional officers that have died. This is, photo is from one prison where 2,200 prisoners in that prison tested positive. We also unlike many other countries, we have a lot of nursing care facilities. We don't take care of our elderly people at home um, like other countries. We don't have much of this, uh, of a tradition of multi-generational families living together. So older people often go to an assisted living care, a nursing home, some kind of uh, long-term care facility. Um, more than 788,000 residents and employees of these types of homes have been infected and we've seen more than 100,000 deaths in, in long-term care facilities. So about one third of all the deaths in the United States have been um, to this. Uh, so I'm gonna skip this. I think I made my point about Trump already. Um, we are so I wanted to talk to you. We don't, we're not going to do a group exercise, but maybe I could just have you type in the chat. So keep you awake. Um, I know I've talked quite a lot right now, but I would like to ask you. So if the WHO came up with some recommendations uh, on how to kind of curb the Corona a virus. So what, what needed to happen? And there were eight main pillars or recommendations. And I wanted to see if you could, if you could uh, guess what those are. So do you, you could type in the chat, maybe, what would the recommendations be for from the WHO uh, that would Re that would relate to how to curb your coronavirus, your COVID-19 rates. Any ideas? I'll give you a minute, don't be shy. You could put it in Bahasa if you want and Dr. Harianto will translate. It's been a long time since I practiced my Bahasa. <laughs> Too bad I couldn't be there in person. Any any ideas? Were you being shy? We used to say in in Bali, Jangan Malu. I don't know if you if that's how you say it in in uh, Java. Um, okay. Well, I'll move on then. Nobody wants to answer. Let's. So these are. So um, Dr. Tedro said the best defense against any outbreak is a strong health system. And COVID 19 is revealing how fragile many of the world's health systems and services are forcing countries to make difficult choices on how to best meet the needs of their people. So they came up with these operational planning guidelines, um, how to respond to COVID while also 
you still have, have other problems that are happening in your country. It's not only COVID, but you still have, you know, babies being born and surgeries that need uh, to take place and people with chronic conditions. And so to make sure that there is not a collapse, you really have to reorganize yourselves, uh, maintain quality and access to essential health services, uh, prioritize, you know, what, how to make sure you can provide a continuity of service, of services, and at, at times um, shift resources to as needed. So we've seen here and maybe probably there as well, rheumatologists now um, being, you know, COVID, taking over COVID patients, for example. Uh, and so these were, these were some of, uh, these were the eight recommendations. So making sure that you have well-organized and prepared health systems and that they can provide equitable access to uh, care. And also risk communication and community engagement uh, making sure that you're providing that information to your community. Uh, pillar number three is surveillance and rapid response, uh, contact tracing and case investigation, uh, which we did not have for a very long time here. Uh, pillar four was controlling your points of entry and make so enforcing things like 14 day quarantine. Pillar five is making sure you have national laboratories uh, to be able to provide testing. And six was infection prevention and control measures. Pillar seven is case management. So how, how do you handle when you do have cases? How do you triage? How do you make those difficult decisions? And then uh, pillar eight is operational support and logistics. So this requires up-to-date up information, um, frequent transparent communications across the uh, public and out to the community so that the public can maintain trust um, that they, you, will, you do have services uh, to meet their needs. Let's see, I'm gonna skip this. I wanted to show you that Americans are, another study found that Americans are more likely than other people to report mental health concerns during COVID. Just This is just since the outbreak started. 33% of Americans reported experiencing stress, anxiety, uh, and other mental health problems. Also, negative consequences, economic consequences uh, from COVID-19. And this in could include losing their jobs, uh, using up all their savings, right? Not having money for food or rent. Americans, Australians and Canadians were most likely to report losing a job or income uh, almost uh, well, 27% of you in the US. Also wanted to sh uh, point out that, you know, it's not just uh, um, COVID deaths, but we're seeing excess number of deaths due to other things when people are not getting their blood pressure medications, not they're scared to go to the hospital they don't have good access to care. And also this study looked at how much, how much you trust um, your leadership. And you could see that our, the trust in President Trump mostly or completely trust was only about 30%. So Americans are, more, are less likely than people in other, these other countries to have a positive opinion of the government's pandemic response. 
And it's not surprising, right? After everything I've told you. Um, so my last slides have to do with a proof. Shall I show you those or should we take some questions? How would you like to do that? Um, should I just, uh, should I just sh uh, continue? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So I wanted to then pivot now and take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the APRU Global Health Program, because you might be interested in getting involved. So let me show you the APRU Global Health Program um, is a nonprofit network, as Dr. Haryanto mentioned. Uh, it represents more than 500,000 staff and 2 million students. And the I'm the director of the Global Health Program. University of Indonesia is a longtime partner, a longtime member of APRU. And these are some of the other universities around the world uh, that belong to this organization. So you can see many countries, many universities, uh, very, oh, very reputable um, universities belong to the APRU network. So many in all the way from Japan, Korea, China, Australia, uh, US, etc. Okay, and this is the leadership. Um, this and we are now switching in 2000. 21, and I, I have asked Dr. Harianto to be one of our um, members of the leadership team. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. So we have a lot of opportunities for you to get engaged and benefits uh, to, to becoming involved. And I just wanted to mention a couple of these. So we have had, uh, we have an annual conference and next, so we just had it in October, it was held virtually and it was organized by Fudan University in China and it was free. The 2021 conference will also be held virtually. So it's an opportunity for you to get involved and it will be held in mid-November. Uh, the theme is urban health. So if you're interested in that, our keynote speaker this year was Mar Margaret Chan, the former director general of the WHO. We also have some uh, poster, student poster contests. So if you're interested, you can submit your poster. And this year, one of our graduate finalists was from the University of Indonesia. And I didn't, I didn't put um, that on there, but Bernardo Prayogo Hasi Holan from University of Indonesia was one of our graduate winners. So congrats to him. And um, so any poster that is submitted by a student is automatically accepted for the conference. So that this is a way for you to get um, an international poster presentation for, for global health on your CV. We also have a global health case competition and the registration will begin in February and the competition usually begins in March or April and teams of four to six students will be given maybe longer again if it is since it's virtual we might give you like 16 weeks uh, to prepare a hypothetical program so we give you a topic and some parameters for example this year's competition was relating to how to improve elderly care in one asia pacific um, a city or country and you were given a hypothetical budget of $5 million for three years. And you were asked, what would you do to improve elderly care? So you, you, you're with your team, you 
make a video in English, a 10 minute video. And then your videos are judged by an international panel of experts from around the world. We choose three finalists and then the finalist videos are shown at the annual conference where we choose a winner. Guess what? I'm going to give you some really exciting news. For the second time, University of Indonesia, Indonesia students took first place in our competition this year. So we had 45 teams from 22 universities in 12 different countries. We had University of Indonesia and Gajah Mada students participate from Indonesia this year. First place went to these students. So fantastic job, congratulations. And this was the second time that they have taken first place. And last year they came in also as a finalist. So your students are really, um, absolutely impressive and I would encourage you to sign up again for next year's competition. The students say it's a really wonderful um, opportunity to engage in a real world challenge. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. We also have some distance education courses. So we have two courses, we just finished them. One is um, on leadership and one is on ethics. And we, for 10 or 11 weeks in the fall, so September to December, we meet together online simultaneously and we work together in international teams. For example, this year in the global leadership um, course, we had seven universities from five countries in Japan, China, Singapore, Mexico, and the US signing on simultaneously and talking about uh, going through case studies and talking about leadership and hearing from experts. So if, you, if a faculty is interested there, uh, we would love to welcome your students for um, next year's uh, ethics or leadership. And then the final thing I wanted to mention is we have a call for papers uh, on immigrant and refugee health. We actually extended the deadline until February 1st. And we have waivers, fee waivers. So this is a, a very good journal in terms of impact factor. And if you're coming from an APRU member institution and you have, uh, you're from a middle income country, we can waive the fee for you. So if you do anything related to migrant and refugee health, uh, please consider submitting to that. We've had a number of publications on global health education, on air pollution, on drugs, um, on, again, more education and migration. And, and we also have conducted a workplace wellness survey of 29 universities, and that is available on our website as well. So we had a number of spotlights and um, best practices. We also have some research working groups and in February or March, we're going to be holding the bioethics working group will be holding a three part mini certificate in research health research ethics for students. So um, a lot of universities say they don't get enough training, they feel like they could use more training in bioethics and we're going to do it from a very interactive and practical way of uh, looking at, at, at cases and talking in small groups and doing uh, some exercises that way. So please um, consider if you have any questions about any of that, uh, please uh, take a look at our website and I could type that in 
or feel free to email me with questions. Um, and if you would like to join our listserv to get more information, then I'm happy to have you join our listserv. I just put our email address in the chat in the chat box. All right, I'm ready for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting topics and so many information that we can learn uh, considering how the United States uh, responds to COVID-19. So uh, please take a bit of rest, Prof. Melissa. Uh, I'd like to collect the question from the participants. Uh, okay, uh, Bapak Ibu, teman-teman partisipan dari channel lecture ini, silakan kalau mau uh, bertanya ya. Uh, seperti tadi disampaikan bahwa uh, Prof. Melissa ada ahlinya Global Health dan saya juga sebagai direktur dari APRU, APRU Global Health Program. APRU tadi sudah disebut bahwa terdiri dari 50 uh, universitas di Asia Pasifik ya, yang di Indonesia sendiri diwakili oleh UI, kayak di Singapura itu oleh MBS, National University of Singapore, di Malaysia itu UM, University of Malaya. Malaya. Uh, <tuh> Tapi ketika konferensi tahunan itu dari mana-mana ya, dari Kajamaka, dari Unbus, dari Umer, dari UKI, dari Umpat, Umpat, pada hadir ya, ada dari Makassar, Bali juga pada hadir di setiap tahunnya. Di sana nanti di setiap panitia setempat ya, misalnya, Uh, tahun ini ya, di Sudan ya Sudan ini seperti itu mereka kerjasama dengan uh, satu jurnal tertentu gitu ya yang kemudian bisa apa mereka mereka yang diterima untuk presentasi bisa diundang untuk menyampaikan uh, manuskripnya gitu. dan biasanya tidak bayar seperti yang Dua tahun lalu kalau tidak salah itu tuan rumahnya University of Malaya, Malaya ya itu kerjasamanya dengan ASN Jurnal. ASN Jurnal itu Jurnal uh, Q3 kalau nggak salah ya. Q2 atau Q3 gitu. Jadi teman-teman yang uh, diterima papernya lalu presentasi itu kemudian ditawarin untuk Kampus di Jurnal dan eh, tahun 2020 awal kemarin eh, terbit di edisi khusus di ASM ASM Jurnal ASM Jurnal itu eh, Academic of Science Malaysia Academic of Science Malaysia jadi IP-nya ini IP-nya Malaysia kalau di Indonesia kan Academic Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia <tuh> bagus jadi selalu kaitannya dengan Jurnal oke okay, itu untuk APRU Nah, uh, kalau ada pertanyaan untuk yang United States experience COVID-19 response dilakukan. Uh, tadi termasuk pertanyaan dari uh, Melissa yang belum ada yang menjawab kalau saya lihat. Sebenarnya WHO sudah suggestion uh, dari WHO apa sih yang kira-kira bisa Eh, apa namanya bermanfaat untuk menurunkan kasus COVID-19 di Indonesia. Nah, itu kira kira, -kira pertanyaannya. Jadi, eh, kelihatannya eh, belum ada berani jawab karena memang kasus di Indonesia naik terus. Suggestion dari WHO atau juga belum. Kelihatannya belum kelihatan. Meskipun di KM itu kan juga suggestion dari WHO yang harus eh, diterapkan di seluruh eh, dunia ya. Uh, baik, uh, oke okay, Mel Melissa, uh, actually uh, the your question of concerning the indicator WHO uh, suggestion for Indonesia to respond to COVID-19. Uh, 
uh, actually we call it uh, as a uh, protocol kesehatan health protocol ya yeah, like uh, in other countries in the world uh, such as uh, always uh, wearing mask wearing mask and then uh, uh, frequently uh, wash hand pay water and so and uh, social distancing uh, that's uh the implementation actually is under question some of uh people follow the rule follow the protocol health protocol but some others maybe more than more others are not uh, uh, disciplined <laughs> on uh, following the uh, suggestion <coughs> and this uh even even the, the government always uh, uh socialize socialize this this uh, uh message uh that's why probably uh the participant uh malu malu or is difficult to answer because uh the cases number in indonesia still increasing means that the WHO suggestion of consuming the health protocol uh, is not easy to be answer uh, since uh, in uh, yeah this since the increasing of the cases in Indonesia is not uh, tend to decrease so we we have no any experience uh, in decreasing the cases daily cases in Indonesia and uh, actually we have uh, uh, two questions that probably you already uh, read uh, from the chat box uh, the question from Putut how are you as preparation for mass vaccination and uh, are the US people ready for uh, be given the vaccination, it is the question from Kudus. And I found another question is, uh, yeah, Pfizer has already been used in Indonesia. Eh, sorry, in United States. Uh, Why? Uh -huh. Yeah. And and Indonesia will 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 use uh, Sinovac. Uh, why it's different? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, let's see. So thank you for the question. So are the U.S. preparing for mass vaccination? Um, yes, definitely. The ship <clears throat> first shipment is on the way to California right now. And those are going to be reserved for, uh, you know, for high risk groups. So I think it's going to be a few months before, you know, people like general public people like me would be able to get access to the vaccine. Um, but certainly there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of people who are saying they wouldn't want to get it immediately. Uh, those are also people who, who maybe don't believe as much in science or don't understand the process. Certainly there's a, a lot of skepticism, but the, the people who are risking their lives every day, the, the essential workers, the uh, healthcare workers, certainly are ready to get it as soon as it becomes available. So I think, I think there's a lot of hope for the future that this will, that we'll be able to get everyone vaccinated next year. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And then next question, um, I'd be happy to share my uh, slides from this seminar and then uh, let's see, why are we using Pfizer and not Sinovac? I think it, you know, it just um, has to do with how the um, 
early negotiations were. And, you know, in, in the, in, we had a program called uh, Work Speed, Project Work Speed, uh, where basically we, we committed to vaccine manufacturers that we would cover their costs through taxpayer money if their vaccines failed. So it was less of a, a risk for them to, to produce millions of doses. Um, and so I, I think it just has to do with uh, those early negotiations, but I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I think we'll be also be using other vaccines in addition to Pfizer um, as they become available. And um, there was also a question from um, Dion Trishna. Yeah. And now that the USA has a new president elect, Joe Biden, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, uh, you can breathe. That was a real biter, right? Everybody was like, ooh, for about two. Um, what can we expect from him? So he has already started. He has started appointing um, a new task force, a new medical uh, leaders and advisors who actually have experience in public health and medical, uh, you know, medical degrees. And he, including Dr. Fauci and others, a very, very well-respected team already has um, been appointed. And he has already started um, talking about increasing um, the mandates and requirements of masks and m becoming much more strict uh, in terms of public health measures across the entire country instead of letting each state decide. So those of us looking in public health, we're looking forward to a new era. But I, I was actually talking to the former director of the CDC um, a couple of weeks ago because he spoke to my class and he said that the amount of damage that that Trump has done to the public belief in you know in science is going to take years to overcome that damage and then among the three factors that lead to the high COVID-19 cases in the US, uh, which main factor do you think is the most dominant factor? The one that makes the most impact on the increase? Uh, so I would, I would say early on, it was definitely lack of leadership. I feel like our leaders could have been role models and shown people that they need to wear masks and they need to stay home and that kind of thing. But certainly the long, um, the most serious and long lasting impacts come from our failure, uh, our health system failures and the disadvantaged populations, the disparities that we have. Uh, that's why we're seeing such high number of cases and deaths among our uh, racial and ethnic minority groups. So this is long stemming racism and discrimination that really will take many, many years to overcome. And let's see, can you share with us about your experience of handling occupational and mental health among healthcare workers in US healthcare facilities. And are, is there any specific strategy that can uh, you can share with us? Yeah, so that's definitely been a problem, uh, a real problem is burnout is really, really high um, among our healthcare workers. They're working without days off for many weeks. They're witnessing, you know, people dying and dying alone. Uh, it's in isolation where they may not be able to see their family during the last 
you know, days of their lives and it's taken a tremendous impact. Um, things that they are doing, it, they're uh, definitely being more open about mental health. They're encouraging people uh, to speak about it instead of just keeping quiet if you're dealing with problem, mental health problems. They're also um, encouraging them to take time off when they need it, even despite the fact that we you know, are in a pandemic and need our health healthcare workers. Uh, they're allowing them to take time off for grie grievance and for mental health and for, you know, personal issues. Um, and yeah, just a lot, I think a lot more sensitivity that this is a real problem um, and that we can't just be quiet and ignore it. Um, anymore. So I would encourage you to also be open. What, one example, specific example that I can give you is we, we adopted this model from University of Indonesia, uh, University of Washington. Um, it was called the 55 word story. And we, we did something similar with 50 word story, but it's basically a website that healthcare workers can write a 55, very short 55 word story about their experience with COVID and to try to build community and a collective support and give them an, um, a way to, you know, share. So that's something that uh, is helpful. Okay, um, so we did this uh, share. I'd like to uh, read the share from Dr. Brogi and uh, I think this is a uh, last comment. The uh, last uh, we need comment from you, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Indonesia has COVID 19 task force that has been set eight targets, namely. Uh, one starting from protecting the vulnerable others, the vulnerable ones, namely group of comorbid patients, the elderly, including health workers. Uh, secondly, how to press how to press active cases and keep it to a minimum. And third, perform increased testing, tracing, and treatment. Four effort to create a conducive environment for the national vaccination program. And fifth, improve reagent and increase availability of PCR and PPE, personal protective equipment. And then the sixth, how to do massive social, socialization, utilizing all national resources. And seven, make increased behavior change towards health protocols. And lastly, as well as increasing the data in what interoperability of health, economic, and social data information. Okay, this is actually the task force COVID-19 in Indonesia uh, targets. So, uh, do you have any uh, comment uh, about this? Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I think what we're seeing is um, we're, first of all, I love the inclusion of protecting vulnerable populations uh, because that's uh, something obviously that I talked about in, in my talk and a problem that we're, we're seeing here. And that's coming from a human rights framework, which is very, I think, applaudable. Uh, so I love that. Um, and then many of, of your other, uh, it, it seems like we have similar um, similar recommendations. Yeah, in, increased behavior change is something we definitely need to work on. And I talked about the lack of data, but we, we how can we, you know, how can we manage this if we don't know who is, at risk and where our cases are. And 
So uh, um, I love, I love that. So wonderful. Uh, probably we can uh, stop until uh, 12 p.m. Yeah, uh, we still have uh, some more minutes. Uh, uh, this is actually that uh, we are thinking right now concerning the coming of vaccination in Indonesia as well as uh, almost the same, almost a similar situation in the United States. As you already mentioned as well, that uh, the priority, several priority um, a specific population will be given first. Yeah, like uh, those who are working in uh, uh, health services and then uh, those related to face-to-face uh, uh, -face services to, uh, to, to people. And then uh, also uh, so for others, uh, specific population. Uh, it's meant that uh, it, like in Indonesia, uh, we have uh, almost 275 million people. And if we are doing vaccination, of course, uh, to achieve the herd immunity, yeah, uh, we need about 60 to 70 percent of population are vaccinated. And uh, since uh, the first priority only several million, let's say only three or four million in the beginning of the nation in, 2000, in the early of 2021, and then followed by uh, several specific population others. Uh, uh, almost 30 million people will be uh, given in 2021. Means that to achieve 60 to 70 percent of the 175 million people, is, uh, it will be long, long way <laughs> to go. Mm -hmm. uh, how is the US experience or strategy uh, concerning? Is uh, what are the steps or strategy on, on, on achieving the uh, herd immunity uh, from uh, vaccination? Mm. Yeah, so um, I, I haven't heard the exact numbers, but I know Fauci said, you know, we should try not to rely on, on uh, or think about herd immunity, but just get try to get everyone who's uh, willing to get vaccinated. Um, and I think the good thing is that our, we have a better system in place now that we've been testing. We've done these mass testing, things that we a year ago never would have been able to imagine. We're, we've been able to set up the infrastructure to develop the tests through, for example, in Los Angeles, uh, they're testing thousands and thousands of people a day in their cars. So drive-by testing, um, opening up stadiums and having uh, whole protocols in place for being able to test. And I think that can now, the system, the infrastructure is in place. We can now pivot towards vaccinating um, in the same way and just you know trying to get uh, as many people as we can at, at the beginning who are at highest risk so uh, you know also immunocompromised elderly people um, but you're right it's going to take I remember in uh, Indonesia and other places I've seen these mass polio eradication, right? Polio vaccine where uh, days where everyone gets, tons of people go out and they vaccinate like millions of children in one day across the entire country. Uh, and they have parades and festivals and posters and banners and get everybody excited about this polio day. Uh, so I think that we're, we have built um, now the tools and experience to do these 
a delivery of mass vaccination campaigns, uh, but you know, we also have to overcome any skepticism or I'm sure misinformation is going to be rampant and as well. So we, we have to do the, um, you know, this, what was listed in these eight targets, also mass socialization and increased behavior changes towards health protocol. So adding the um, educational piece as well. Okay, I think this is the end of the lecture. End of the class. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your sharing and information. And I'd like to ask the uh, audience to give applause to Professor Minsa. <laughs> we are very appreciated. But uh, before closing, uh, remarks that will be given by uh, Ibu Bian again. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Budiatana to share the, uh, something. Okay, silakan Pak Budi. Mute, mute, unmute. Uh, belum di unmute. <coughs> ya baik, terima kasih uh, Prof. Budi atas kesempatannya. Uh, ini mohon izin untuk yang hadir dalam seminar ini melalui uh, streaming YouTube atau juga uh, streaming daripada website FKMUI, mohon mengisi daftar hadir yang sudah kami share berikut karena uh, untuk yang hadir di streaming tidak bisa uh, melihat apa yang ada di daftar uh, chat kita. Jadi mohon bantuannya silahkan untuk uh, mencatat uh, linknya dan kemudian mengisi uh, daftar hadirnya. Uh, demikian mungkin Prof. Silakan dilanjut Prof. Ya. <tuh> Oke terima kasih. Uh, Bu Bian masih ada kan? Bu Bian, ya masih ya. ada Prof. <tuh> Silakan di ditutup tutup. saja oleh Pak Budi Hartono. Saya menyimak. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy the sharing session from uh, Professor Melissa. So closing uh, remarks come will uh, coming from Prof Budi or Dr Budi Hartono. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so for, much, Prof Melissa. Yeah. Thank you very much for Prof Melissa Withers uh, uh, from your presentation and your sharing about the experience uh, how to uh, manage the pandemic of uh, coronavirus in USA and we have uh, learned more experience and uh, more opportunity uh, maybe to uh, apply this in uh, Indonesia according to uh, rule for the WSO and uh, you also share a big opportunity to us to, to join with the APRO uh, program and uh, hope uh, our students can uh, join this uh, program next year. Thank you very much for your uh, willingness to join for this, uh, to this activity and thank you very much, success and also uh, help for uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Saya kembalikan ke Prof. Budi. Yeah. <coughs> Terima kasih. Terima, kasih. Terima, terima kasih Prof Melisa. Terima kasih banyak sama-sama. Ah, sama-sama. Ya. Terima kasih banyak. Prof. Selamat Melisa. malam ya. Right now it's 9 p.m. right? Uh, oke. Okay. Yeah. Thank you Prof Melisa. Ya. Yeah. Terima kasih Prof Budi Haryanto. Sama-sama Bu Robiana, terima kasih banyak buat para peserta yang sudah hadir Mudah-mudahan uh, acara ini bermanfaat buat menambah wawasan kita bersama Dan sekali lagi kami juga mengundang untuk sesi sore nanti Jam 4 sore dengan uh, ilmuwan diaspora Yang juga uh, ilmunya mungkin bermanfaat buat uh, kita semua Jadi kami tetap uh, mohon dan menunggu kehadiran uh, para serta atau hadirin yang saat ini juga hadir untuk bisa hadir kembali di sesi sore nanti dalam acara webinar FKM yang ke-49. Terima kasih banyak. 
Uh, salam sehat selalu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye bye, Prof. Melisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Have a very good evening. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. <coughs>